welcome. It's lovely to have the all our committee members here. A special warm welcome to members of the public who are here and our staff. Not too sure if we've got any media, but if we do, you'll warmly welcome as well. Um, just to remind people that this is being filmed, so just for members of the public to, to let you know. Now, we've got apologies. Um, I also want to w welcome Nicholas Main. I think Nicholas from the Upper Harbour local, local Board. Warm welcome, Nicholas. Now, we've got apologies, mag off until about 11 o'clock, lateness on council business. Councillor Hills for lateness on council business, who's presenting to the Auckland Transport Board, and um, Councillor Darby, who's absence on council business, he's at the Treffins um, conference. Any other? Councillor Fletcher for early departure. Oh, I'm happy to move those. Is there a seconder? Second. Councillor Casey, I'll put that. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Yes, carried. Thank you. Um, any specific issues that people want to raise with regard to declarations of interest? If not, just be vigilant and if anything comes up, just let us know. And I'll move the minutes of the 16th of October. Councillor Filipino will second. I'll put those, all those in the public, please say aye. 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 Against. Carried. Now, we don't have any petitions. Now, public input, you will have noticed... Um, that we were going to have public in input from Ngaitai, Taiki Tamaki and Niwa on sediment discharge from the Wairua River. And the item, I think, James, is where you've asked for it to come February. to February? Yeah, cool. OK, so we'll still have that um, item in February. We've got the we've got community to present on the Hobsonville Point issue and Glenfern Sanctuary, so some great presentations. And I just want to acknowledge, while we are talking about presentations, at local board input, Lisa White the, um, will present on behalf of the Upper Harbour Local Board as part of the confidential section. And I just want to note, and our sympathies to Margaret Miles, who was going to be doing the presentation, but her mum passed away um, a few days ago. So love and aroha to, to Margaret and her family. Um, otherwise, the rest of the meeting should be reasonably straightforward. So if everyone's comfortable with that, we'll start. And I'd like to invite the members of the Hobsonville Bomb Point Action Committee, and I think we've got. Oh, warm well, welcome. Right. Are you going to kick off? Yep, I'll, I'll start. Is that so right? we've got, yeah, you've got 10 minutes. 10 minutes, wow. Present, um, give us your thoughts, then members will ask questions just while you sure. take a deep breath and get comfortable. Members, I just want to remind you that we will be discussing this item in confidence. Obviously, the reason for confidence is the fact that we will be negotiating the purchase of land and we certainly don't want to be talking about how much we might have in the budget for doing that because we've got some fairly tense negotiations to be having with the government effectively who own this land. Um, we're also um, not you know, giving out all the information on the size of land that we're wishing to purchase um, and we certainly on behalf of the ratepayers of Auckland we want to keep our powder dry for as I say some fairly difficult negotiations so I just ask that members be aware of that in the questions that we ask of our presenters. So warm welcome, floor is yours. Thank you. Um, <coughs> my name is Grant Dixon. I'm the chairman of the Bomb Point Action Committee. And uh, my name is Julian Molyneux. I'm a resident of Hobsonville Point and a member of the Bomb Point Action Committee. Um, we're a committee of ten members, uh, uh, including two solicitors or lawyers, um, and we're very concerned. So let me just go through the slides. I'll talk to each slide, and um, I guess you could ask questions at the end. Um, so a bit of history. You're probably aware of it. Um, previously, the bomb, that, that's a picture of the Bomb Point Reserve there, that, where all those little buildings are. Um, that was a previously Defence Force land, and in 2002, 2003, it was transferred to the uh, Housing um, New Zealand, um, uh, to another government department. 
Uh, in 2008, the Waitakere City Council moved that Bond Point be a major destination park on behalf of the whole of the Auckland region. I think uh, Penny was actually on that committee at the time. Or, Linda. Linda, was it? Okay. I seconded it by the look of it. <laughs> Councillor Dallow moved it. Indeed. Who so, lives down there now? Oh. So, um, so it has some history and it also has some standing, I believe. It may, it may even have standing in the law. Uh, at the same time, a letter was sent to the. Uh, sorry, I suppose I should just push this along. Uh, at the same time, a letter was sent to the Auckland Regional Council. At least I assume it was. It was definitely moved uh, along the same lines that the Bond Point Park would become a regional park, as the, as, it, as was defined on that day. I think the de definition might have changed since then. Um, the uh, Bond Point is, is uh, more than just a suburban park, and this is an issue that you're going to be discussing later today, I'm sure, the difference between suburban parks and regional parks and destination parks. These have all got different meanings, but it's more than a suburban or, um, uh, uh, park. It's a destination park. It, I guess it's not large enough for a regional park. Regional parks have got uh, huge numbers of hectares, but this is 11.2. We're talking about 11.2 hectares. Um, a suburban park, I'm told, is up to five hectares, so it's, it's a bit more than a suburban park but it's definitely a destination park. And to, to basically um, follow that up, you would have seen adverts on the television uh, advertising the gala opening of the walkway this coming weekend. Uh, apparently 16,000 people are expected to get on the boats, come across the harbour and visit that park. And a key part of that park is Bomb Point. Um, Bomb Point is, has, um, um, Nick, uh, who's on the back, who's, who's going to talk about it later on, on today, um, it refers to it as the crowning jewel of the 5K walkway, and it definitely is the crowning jewel, Bomb Point Park, and it's definitely um, a great attraction to all Aucklanders, who are even today, before it's even developed, while it's still in its raw, raw state, is attracting thousands of people to it. So it's definitely more than a suburban park. Um, in 2003, the Housing uh, New Zealand purchased Bomb Point Park uh, as part of a 30.5 hectare uh, parcel of land, which they paid $22 million for. 2003 is not that long ago. Um, so uh, it's about a third of the, Bomb Point Park is about a third of that area. So in that day, it had a, a market value, or so, 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 should I say a purchase value of $8 million. And that was arranged by bind, binding arbitration, uh, binding arbitration process. And my contention to you is that that's still binding today. W while it was passing from one government department to another, uh, I think you could argue, at least I would argue, that passing it to the council is just as binding as to another public uh, <coughs> department. And eight million is the figure you should be working with, not a penny more. That's what it should be. Any more than that, I would suggest, is usury and just inf inflationary capital gain. So eight million is the figure. Um, moving on. Um, all Hobbsville Point property owners have been brought into the area with the full expectation that this 11.2 hectares will be parked. Now this is a critical point. It's a point of honesty and truth. Um, we've been told by Hobbsville Point repeatedly in all their publications, even today as you come into Hobbsville Point, they talk about 24, point, 24 hectares. And this is part of that 24 hectares. They're advertising even today that this will become public reserve. Um, all the real estate people um, have advertised in their brochures. I brought into the area with the full expectation that 11.2 will be public reserve. Um, there's a real point of um, honesty and truth here. Uh, even, even I think it could be contested in law. Um, and as I say, we do have several, several solicitors on our committee. So if we have to go down the road, we certainly will look at it. And Bond Point is, is a big area. We talk about it being a medium uh, density uh, subdivision. In actual fact, parts of it is high density. This part here is high density. We're looking at a 16-storey building there and multiple five- and six-storey um, block blocks surrounding it. That's high density. There's, there's no other word for it. And, and high density areas need, need breathing space. Now, and, and, and we, need, we need more than just the five um, hectares that have, have been mentioned in the past. Um, and then we can quickly uh, compare to other areas. Um, well, but before that, apparently the numbers have doubled just recently, so from 2,500 up to 5,000 houses. So we're looking at about 15,000 residents now, probably more. And if we compare uh, Tiahitu to Peninsula, just next Peninsula down, smaller population, 12,500. They have 31 community facilities. We have barely half a dozen. Uh, brand new library, 6,700 uh, seat auditorium, multiple car parks. Car parks, you just can't find them on Bond Point. Club rooms, churches, extensive uh, reserve area. In fact, I haven't worked out how many hectares it is, but I suspect it's probably more than what we're looking at here. Um, so compared to other suburbs, we're not doing that well. 
Um, th there's also uh, Scott Point over the road, but that's basically going to be um, having a sports field, and apparently it's a, a ecological reserve. It's a completely different type of reserve on that, on that area. Um, this is a destination park we're talking about with potential for the future. And if you add Scott Point to Hobsonville population, you might get up to 30,000 uh, 30, people, I should say. Well, that's the size of Gisborne. We're talking about a city here. How many parks does a normal city have? It should, certainly has more than you know, half a dozen. And then you add in Whenua Pai, Green Hive, and the whole Upper Harbour area. Um, all these people, will, even today, I, I, I manage the, uh, manage the Hobsonville Facebook page, and a lot of people come into the area to walk their dogs and so forth. We, we, we pull from the whole Upper Harbour community today. And um, this was referred to in a, a, a paper that I've just um, showed up there too, that the residents uh, will, uh, hop, hop, sorry, Scott Point residents will use the park and so will the whole wider Upper Harbour community. And the other thing we need is to land bank. Now, we're not wanting you to put lots of money into the development of this land. We just want the land. We want it banked for the next two, three, four generations. Somewhere in the future, these things could be done on that land. We don't have any plunket rooms. We don't have a skateboard park. We're going to have a lot of teenagers in 10 years' our time. We've got a lot of babies at the moment. There'll be a lot of teenagers in 10 years' time. And they need a place to play. We need land to actually expand onto. Um, you know, who knows? We could have an outdoor swimming pool. I know the swimming pools are hard to get in Auckland, but um, we, we, and of course we've got the Hobsonville Re Resident Society. They've just put $50,000 into a weekend uh, ferries across the harbour um, because they, we, because we all vo voted for it, we support the development of this area. And we could also put money into plunket rooms or into uh, paddling pools or whatever it is that we decide we want. So we're there to actually help you make it happen. So, so it's not just your money, it's our money as well. Um, and in the past, we have had to go to the barricades, so to speak. Two years ago, a protest um, was organised. We got about up to 700 signatures on a um, campaign that we were running. Uh, we stopped the campaign because Hobson Paul came out with a letter, a Hobson Paul Point Land Company, I should say, came out with a letter saying um, that they will not build on that land. So we stopped then. That was two years ago, but now it seems like it's come under threat again. Um, and so we will, if, if you do not support this, or if you start to move in an area that we lose that other six hectares or seven hectares that's in threat, um, we will be out there, we will protest, and we will vote, because the elections are next year, and we will remember that when we vote. I'm sorry, but I've just got to say that. So finally, to wrap up, um, the Hobsonville Point uh, Residence Society at the AGM just a few weeks ago, um, which was attended by three or 400 people, <coughs> voted almost unanimously. There was only one dissenting vote. I don't know who that one person was. But everybody else was in favour that the whole 11.2 hectares should be passed over to the council as a public reserve. Um, and our contention is that we should not settle for a, a hectare less. Um, the Upper Harbour um, Board strongly favoured it, and Nick's going to talk about that this afternoon, apparently. Um, and they are right behind us in this as well. And ironically, um, Hobbs, the Hobbsville Land Company seems to be um, in favour of it as well. Um, we had a meeting with Chris Aiken a, a week or two ago, and he was saying that they have no, no plan, plan B. They have no way, no intention to um, subdivide that land that's left over, even after negotiations. They, their full intention is that land will be public space. So my challenge to you is to not accept anything uh, less than 11.5. Uh, we know that the report is probably going to recommend to you up to five hectares, um, and that's not enough. That's not even half. Uh, it's 11.5 is the figure. Um, Chris also uh, mentioned to us that, or is inferred to us, that they are prepared to negotiate. There, ha there are other aspects that they want to negotiate on the point, um, and it sounds like you could possibly do a deal for the remaining land. So um, we strongly employ you to not give up Keep going for that 11.2 hectares. Don't settle for anything less. Don't settle for five or less. Um, we, the residents, really expect that land to be park, and we need it, and so does the whole of Auckland. Thank you. Thank you. Trillian, did you wish to...? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I understand that the negotiations over this piece of land and its future have been ongoing for a very long time, going back to the early 2000s, and that both HLC, which is a government agency, and council are in uh, a difficult position and that you both have to be responsible to the people that fund you. And HLC 
can't be seen to be giving away an asset that has a book value. Council can't be seen to buying a huge amount of land at a market value when it could perhaps um, meet some of its, tick some of its boxes with less land or at a lower price. Um, and, and so things have stalled. We're very keen for face-to-face -face negotiations to pick up again between Council and HLC and to find some way forward. We do think that HLC wants to resolve this. They, have, they do make public commitments to 24 hectares of green spaces at Hobsonville Point development overall. Um, it's on the big billboard as you enter the point that that's their commitment. And so they have to find a way forward to ensure that this becomes public space uh, or they can't meet that commitment. And they, you know, they're in breach of the Fair Trading Act in terms of a lot of their real estate development if they don't meet that. So we think that there's scope there for Council to go in with 11.2 hectares as their goal, rather than, say, a suburban park of five hectares maximum, um, and to think of creative ways of making that happen, whether some of it is purchased, some of it is gifted, some of it is a trade-off against, um, as Grant pointed out, some of the increasing density that's happening since the development first began. But if um, Council goes in with a view to 11.2 as the ideal outcome rather than five hectares as the ideal outcome, then that's possible to achieve. HLC needs that to happen. Um, and it, the residents of Hobsonville Point who have moved into the area with that as a view, that's their expectation. Um, and we, we're advocates of medium density housing in Auckland. We're people who have moved into an area that's a building site and it's going to continue being a building site for some years forward. We've given up our personal private space on the promise that we have public space available to us. And that's the trade-off. And it would be a betrayal of the people who have moved there for that to not happen. HLC assure us that they have no plan B, but they are property developers, and they are looking at making money out of their development. Um, so if the council were to say we're only prepared to buy five hectares, HLC is then in a position to blame the council and say we've, you know, what are we supposed to do? Um, council doesn't want this land as a reserve, therefore we'll look at our other options which might include development. So we do see a vulnerability there. On the one hand, HLC wants this to be a reserve, but if council can't find a way forward, um, they will blame council for the failure for it to become a reserve in its entirety. And that's the risk that we see. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I know we've got a line-up of questions. It was just really remiss of me at the beginning of the meeting not to acknowledge our Senior Governance Advisor, Mai Petrick. And I just also want to point out, and this may um, delight and concern some people, that you are represented at the top table here by a bunch of good whisky women. So we've known well done, Mai Dean. for a very, very long time. So Mai has taken over from, from Tam. And, of course, we've got Sandra on our far right, again, a woman that we've known and worked with for a very, very long time. So we are ably supported by, by these two, who also, I have to say to our, our um, public presenters, know this area intimately, as well as we've dealt with it over many years at, at Waitakere. And I think I chaired the committee that these, some of these decisions were made at. So it all comes around. Right, let's go to Councillor Clo, who was also there as these things were debated. Thank you for your presentation. <clears throat> There's a couple of threats in there, which, which you're entitled to make. It's up to you. Um, it doesn't normally go down well around the council table. <coughs> I'll out to you. Um, so um, for those of us standing in that water, you know, your ears will be burning. But um, you also <coughs> talked about legal action. I'm assuming any legal action you are contemplating will be against the Hobsonville Land Company yes. and not the council because we ain't done anything wrong. Um, it seems the other people have been misleading and they've got away with it and it's still sitting there on big billboards, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so is that where your legal action is going? Um, it would be Fair Trading Act. Yeah, OK, fair enough. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for the clarification, Councillor. Councillor Wayne Walker. Cool. Um, got a few questions. Um, first off, um, Grant, you mentioned the space requirements for a number of things that aren't at um, Hobsonville Point, um, and that could include um, scouts, guides, plunket, any range of um, activities that other areas around Auckland have. Are you able to generate a list of them and the space requirements for those sorts of 
facilities? Um, that, that definitely could be done. Um, I'm not sure what point it is, though, because the land has already been taken. Sure. Can I just go to my next um, question, and that is, um, are you aware of um, the Council's consultation around development contributions, which I think is, is still out, and the relationship between acquiring land, especially in greenfield areas, and this could well be described as a greenfield area, and that, that development contributions, that is the money that we get from development contributions, goes directly to the project list, which goes to my earlier question. So, Well, I mean, if there was money there, I assume it would be, for, as you say, for development, but not for land purchase. Land purchase is, is the issue. Okay. So I, I guess between the lines, I'm making a suggestion to you that you get a submission in Sure. around development contributions, and as many of them as possible yes. that go to uh, Bomb Point. And the last question I've got just goes to um, the other party that's not in the room, and that's the Ministers of the Crown, and how actively you've been lobbying them. Um, indeed. Well, that petition that I alluded to, wasn't. Yeah. anyway, uh, before, was to the Minister of that day, and uh, it was replied to from that Minister. Also, the current Minister has also been... Um, written to, and he has replied as well. And, and their the replies are basically the status quo. In fact, according to Chris Aiken, um, the Minister of Housing has told him that they're leaving it to him to decide what happens to Bomb Point. And who are the Ministers of the Crown that you're dealing with here? Phil Clifford. Phil. Uh, Minister of Housing, Phil Clifford. Has he been to see you? No. Uh, we've got a request in for an appointment to see him. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Watson. Uh, thank you for your presentation. That was an excellent presentation. Um, could we have a copy of that, uh, please? Could we arrange for that to be uh, forwarded? Yeah. Thank you. It's, it's, it's over yeah. here, yeah. so I'll pass it on. Yeah. Um, my question goes to um, um, the, the commitment that's been made and, and, of course, the effect that that would have on the Council's bargaining uh, position. I think we understand the Council's position here. Um, so, uh, Hobsonville Lang Company, um, throughout their, their whole involvement have committed to providing uh, 11.2 hectares of open space at Bomb Point. 24 hectares at Hobsonville Point overall, not specifically at Bomb Point. But they can't meet the 24 hectares without including well, well, okay, well, a large 24, chunk of But I, I guess what I'm saying is Bomb Point has been mentioned specifically as being uh, yes. provided in its to totality. Yes, yes, well, there's a letter... No, I think there's been some disagreement about the actual boundaries of what that includes, so okay. in the past. Well, yeah, that's actually, that's a good point. Um, it's a little bit uh, vague around the edges. Uh, a letter was written two years ago when that um, campaign that I uh, led was stopped by um, Chris Aiken, and um, it gave the insurance that Bomb Point would not be sold, but it never specified how much land that was or even the boundaries of the land and even today we still don't know where the boundaries are. Okay, as, as far as your, uh, uh, and this follows on from that, uh, you, your distinction you're drawn between <coughs> a, a suburban park and a regional destination park and you, you referred to the, the centrality of Bomb Point not just as it goes to the 30 odd thousand people that are going to be living very in short time I might add in this general area but also the people who live in the city, which is undergoing uh, huge intensification. Yeah. Now, as I understand it, uh, you mentioned $50,000 from the, um, the Residents Association going to start this weekend ferry service when you'd expect people to, to go to a regional destination. Um, the sum of money, in fact, is, is a bit bigger than that in total. I think it's four or $500,000. And <coughs> the plan is to make that connectivity with the city and the teeming <laughs> hundreds of thousands who live in the city uh, far more accessible. So my question is, in terms of an area where such a, a regional destination could be available in the Auckland uh, region, this is really it, isn't it? Yeah. There is going to be none other. Yeah, um, I, it, I think it comes down to what it's called comes down to you know, the council definitions of different kinds of parks. <coughs> And we understand that it's too small to be called a regional park or a destination park. But it is a destination style park, mm. if you like, um, in a suburban area. Okay. Mm. Yeah, and it's waterfront land, which is also, you know, 
there's that's a limited supply in terms of acquiring new waterfront land so close to the city. Yes, uh, the other thing is it's a key part of the five kilometre walkway, which is going to be open this weekend. Um, thousands will come to walk that walkway, and that walkway goes right around Bomb Point. It encloses that area, and if we can actually develop the middle part of that into something really <coughs> special, that will be a real jewel in Auckland's um, parks. So, so finally, in terms of our decision making here today, you, you understand the council's position, yep. but you want council's um, overall bargaining position to be one to, to hold true to that commitment and, and to look long term as far as Bomb Point goes. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Yes. In fact, I would su suggest that you, you have a moral application to keep that commitment because it was a commitment of the previous council in 2008 <coughs> to do that. And um, just, just because things have changed because of the unitary plan doesn't mean the commitment hasn't been dropped. The commitment is still there. Okay, thank you. Oh, Councillor Casey. Well, just to say that you're right, I'm, I'm looking as a prospective buyer at Hobsonville Point and it says on here there's 24 hectares of reserves and open spaces and I'd quite like maybe some advice some advice from our legal section about the propriety of that and, and the commitment therefore that it seems council is issuing through this website. Sorry, I was just distracted for a moment. I was just trying to clarify something. Sorry, councillor. I just thought you were addressing our no, presenters. No, 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 no. It, it, they're right. It's on here. It's yep. live now. And yep. I wondered yep. about the propriety of it from a legal perspective. And they advertising I, that. Indeed. And I, it's not us. It, that, so that, this is, that would be yeah. an HLC website. That's right. It's yeah. their website. Yep. Yes. So yeah. we, you know, just to be really clear, and I think our presenters have been clear, and the questions that Councillor Watson and Walker both asked made it really clear. The undertakings, the promotion and the advertising has been done by what was then called the Hobsonville Land Company and is now called Homes, Lifestyles and Land and Community. Community. And communities. Um, homes, Living and Community. <laughs> um, something, HLC, that they're the ones who've been promoting. No, I understand that. But what's, what's our obligation as a council yeah. With regard to that, which no. has not yet been decided, and at the moment none. No. So yeah. we no. So that's what we need to talk about when we take some legal oh. advice and we um, have our confidential section. Because you know, to be really honest, this is not us being cute. We want to make sure that we are holding every possible card when we go into negotiations with the Hobsonville Land Company. And I think our presenters have made that really clear. So I'd, I'd rather we talked about uh, that and I, confidence. I, I would make one comment though. I think there's a moral, at least a moral obligation on this council because of what the Waitakere Council did, uh, City Council did in 2008 and what they passed. Um, and I think that does come forward. So there is some obligation I think on this committee. Yeah. Just to be clear though, for those of us who were part of Waitakere mm. Council, the conversation was exactly the same. Mm. We wanted to nego negotiate with the government to say we will buy a portion of the land and can you give us the rest, thank you very much, because it's no secret, nor is it, you know, in confidence, that this isn't, apart from the beauty of the site, it's not a great buy. It has some major issues around remediation, unexploded ordinances and historic sites. So, you know, we, we need to be really clear, and this is absolutely Groundhog Day, the undertakings that Waitakere made were to work with Te Kaurau Amaki and the settlements around the Marae site, to buy an appropriate sized site that the Waitakere Council would be prepared to pay for, to negotiate with the then Auckland Regional Council about the, some of the residual land and to undertake to work with the then government to say, come on, come to the party and help us out with the whole site. So those, you know, we are, in my view, continuing that, that discussion so look, we just need to be really clear about that. And, um, you know, again, we'll, we'll go into further detail as required. Okay, no other questions? I'd like, actually, John, oh, Councillor Watson and Councillor Walk, would you like Absolutely. to move and second the, um, the recommendation thanking Sorry. our presenters warmly? And we'll certainly make sure that the presentation is made available because it was indeed a very clear, concise and excellent presentation. So thank you both very much for attending and for the work that you've done on this ongoing, thank you. Thank you. difficult issue. Thank, and thank you. you for listening to us. Thank, thank you. you.
We'd love to see a resolution to this, believe you me. Good. I'll put that. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against? Carried. Thank you. Now, our next item is our presentation on the Glenfern Sanctuary, which is, um, I think, an exceedingly exciting piece of work. And Scott, are you going to introduce this? And of course, a warm welcome to Izzy, Thank our you. representative of the Glenfern Trust. And um, I'll hand over to you. Good morning. Uh, thank you. Uh, Scott De Silva. I'm the park manager in, within the regional parks team. Um, and I'd like to introduce my, uh, my colleagues here. Um, Izzy Fordham, um, Great Barrier Local Board Chair, and Ian Mort, uh, Chris Morton sorry, from the Glenfern Sanctuaries Trust. Um, I take the report as being read, but I thought it'd be um, worthwhile me going through and just providing a bit of an update in terms of the report that we're provided. Um, we've received a, um, I thought this is a great opportunity to come and update the committee on some of the work that's happened around Glenfern since the, um, the acquisition of that park. Um, and we've also had a biannual report which has been provided by the trust um, on their KPIs, along with a feasibility assessment um, in regards to the um, option of an environmental centre on the island and on the park. Um, Council purchased the Glenfern Sanctuary as regional park in 2016 and in April 17 the Glenfern Trust was established um, and they managed the day-to-day -day operations of the park um, on behalf of Council. Um, we received the biannual report which is attached um, as an attachment to your report um, which demonstrates some of the achievements that the Trust have, um, have met over the last 12 months and um, the, the relationship between um, definitely my team, the Parks team and the Trust has been going really, really well. So we're supporting each other in, in different ways and we're stepping in there when um, either Trust needs assistance or we need assistance, so working really well together. Um, just jumping back a little bit in time, in six, 2000, sorry, 2016 in September, Parks um, Recreation and Sports Committee um, approved the expression of interest process for an education centre on the um, on the island or on the on the sanctuary, and it's been um, a little bit stalled up to that time. I think some work had originally taken place, but not until um, more recently when the local board um, with support provided some financial support to the trust to undertake that that feasibility study on whether the uh, education centre would be uh, a viable option for not only the island but also for the park. So. That's kind of the overview, and I was happy to take any questions. Um, like I said, I, I thought Chris would be um, able to provide any answers on the um, KPIs and the working relationship, and Izzy on the feasibility study. Okay, awesome. Izzy, did you want to add anything to what's been said, or are you happy just to? Oh, take thank you, Madam Chair. No, I'd just like to give our support and thanks to to Scott and the work that his team has done. And yes, the board did um, embark on the feasibility study. We funded it ourselves for um, $20,000 with Envirostrat, as you would have seen in the report to the agenda anyway. And I can honestly say that the board is very keen to progress to the next stage, which is now the business case, of which the board is prepared to fund. So once again, we're not, we're not asking for any money, so I guess that's got to be a bonus in this day and age. Yep. Um, so we're happy to fund that business case, but I guess what we're looking for is the, the endorsement and the okay from the committee today to embark on that, that next step, that's all. Thank you. Okay. Happy to take any questions at all, Madam Chair. Fantastic. And I just really do want to acknowledge the board for this work. I think a group of us came out in yeah. the previous term. We had a look at the work that was being <laughs> done. We were quite blown away with the potential of... of the site, um, and I think you know some some great advocacy by um, Councillor Christine Fletcher and Councillor Mike Lee around this, and you know it's terribly exciting to see that it's actually got to where it's got. And but thank you for the board for really putting your money where your mouth is and and making this happen. So let's take um, questions. Member Blair. Oh, kia ora. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Just the first one is, I mean, I love Altair. It's an amazing place. 
How, how are you going to struggle with the development versus protection of um, the biodiversity in, in that park? Because I understand that um, island does need to develop and move and progress, but um, with that comes the biodiversity risk, waste, um, people, not really, you know, the social and cultural interaction with the island. Could you give, could you kind of expand on your views on how that's, what your view is on, the, on that? Okay, Chris, do you want to, or do you want me to start that okay. conversation? Um, thank you for the question. It's a very good question indeed, and it's one that, you know, we will be working around. But ideally it will be a sustainable centre, so everything will be done in an environmentally friendly way in a sense that it will then become a bit of a showcase once again for the Auckland region. There is a lot of work to do around that aspect and we're hoping that with the business case we're going to be able to delve right into all that stuff. So from the social and economic and, yes. and cultural? And the cultural aspect as well, yes. Yeah. So, so in terms of the numbers that you're expecting to attract there, Kind of what, what were the figures that you'd see an increase? Is it mainly school groups or is it tourists? And It's a bit of a mixed bag, to be perfectly honest with you. It will be the school children. It will be tertiary. There's an opportunity to work in with some overseas universities that are, um, they, they have their terms when we're having our, our summer terms or winter terms, so it's reversed. So there's opportunity for them to come out to Aotea and do some environmental work around that. And of course the dark sky sanctuary status adds to it. As far as numbers are concerned at this stage, I can't give you that. Once again, hoping that that's what the business case will bring forward when we delve into it. For us, it seems the next logical step before we embark on anything greater. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm just thinking of the hordes of Aucklanders pouring over. And <laughs> Ruining the no island way of not. life, <laughs> which I've enjoyed since you know, yeah. I'm a teenager. Um, even, the, but anyway, that's my. The other part is that you've found it quite difficult to connect with an RTD. Who is that, right? Correct. Um, why is that? Because it's not a big place. Um, no, it, it's area. not. It's not a big place, and it, it's not for me to to say what is happening with Ngāti Rehua and Ngāti Waiki Aotea. They have some internal issues at the moment that they are in the process of sorting out so as soon as they're ready to come to that table and they are a vital component to the discussions going forward um, we have to wait for them okay so do you know if they given an indication of when they can come back to you or nothing no yet? unfortunately and and i say that with with regret in my heart that they haven't been able to come to the table for some months now, and until their situation is sorted, we, we can't force them. Okay, thank you, Madam Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Izzy. Just while we see if there's any more questions, the just reading our, our report, um, we've got the next steps on page, or page 139, is that staff will come back to the Environment and Community Committee just to carry on working through the business case, keeping us in the loop and working out what the next steps are, because I think that balance between how do you provide for the people coming anyway and how do you manage the fact that it may be an attractor is what so many of our precious areas have to kind of balance and battle, and I think Member Blair's question was really important. Um, Councillor Clo. Thanks, Izzy, um, and team. Um, Two things: the the land that Kristen's going to be able to build on. Just remind me because I can't remember. Is Kristen then going to share those facilities with other schools, or are they going to have exclusive use to? Uh, Kristen were involved initially after about the time the purchase was made. Um, then they um, they pulled back from wanting to be involved from an internal reason. So the the Kristen have no more place than anybody else. Oh, okay. And in fact, I think we've probably got a 
know, I think there's a view that we really want to keep it pretty open. Yeah, yeah. But, but if, on the other hand, if it came to the point that no one, no one else wanted to be involved and they had money to help kickstart it, then that's something we'd obviously look at. But there's no specific requirement. And, and the dialogue really has, we've had no dialogue with them for the last sort of year at least. Okay. And sorry, you referred to the night sky thing. So this would be really the centre for tourists for night sky observation, etc. You know, you, you want, sorry, I forget the definition of what it is. That's right, Councillor Clark. Um, not necessarily the centre, because we have a number of viewing points. But yes, if they were wanting to develop anything along astronomy and that sort of activity, then Glenfern does offer that with some excellent viewing points itself and having the accommodation available, not only with ourselves, but with Orama over the hill in Karaka Bay. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Any other... Questions, Councillor Lee. Thank you, um, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Izzy and Scott. And um, it's good to see you here, and it's good to get a report on the Glenfern Sanctuary Regional Park. Um, it would be good to get more regular updates in terms of the governing body. I, I realise we don't have a, a Parks Committee anymore, which means that it may be difficult getting priority but it would be good to have regular oversight as we go through this um, process. I certainly support uh, the concept. I am concerned about the complexity of the wiring dam uh, wire, wiring diagram and and the ownership um, inverted commas um, issues. I, I think the simpler the model, the more uh, robust and um, affordable. So I'd be looking towards something uh, as simple as possible. Um, could I ask you a question? Uh, and that is, would this be in some ways seen as a, a rival to Orama um, or no? Complimentary. Thanks, Mike. Um, no, I, we, I mean, we certainly don't want to be in, in competition with them. I think um, there's a, it's a small space out there and everyone needs to work together. So I think that's the next step is to actually get, a, I think it refers to in here, a, a, a stakeholder group together where we can see what everyone wants to achieve and, and we make but sure that there's the, a path for everybody. Thank you for that. Clearly the purpose of the Council in agreeing to acquire the land was not only in regard to biodiversity matters, but also um, realising that this could enhance visitor numbers. So if this enhances visitor numbers, it's in keeping with our original mission. Would, that, would you agree with that? Yes. Absolutely. Can I ask, make one more point? Um, I was out there a few months ago, but um, and I'll be out there uh, pretty soon, I hope. But what I am concerned, given all the drama we went through, probably not that much drama, but it wasn't um, straightforward or quick in acquiring that land, there is, I could see no indication at all um, from local ratepayers point of view or visitors point of view that the council, that Auckland Council, had anything to do with that property. So there needs, I just wonder whether you've got round to putting up the council signage and if it is, is deemed a regional park which is a pretty prestigious category of park that needs to be highlighted to the ratepayers as well yeah uh, yeah thank you mike um i that is something we are working on with the trust we've had a number of i've had a number of discussions with um, um chris clo and um around how we address that so that's something that we've got in the pipeline at this stage but yeah we haven't addressed it as yet I would suggest the trust has been in operation f for some time now, so discussions shouldn't take that long to get some signs up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Lee. Councillor Casey. I just think it's probably time for us to have another visit. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, well, new council. <laughs> well, yeah. New councillors haven't been to see Glenfern, and we need to see the night sky as well. So. Hopefully we can do that before the, the October election That's an next overnight year. That's an overnight you're Absolutely. Some team building when... I have to say the councillors who yeah. took up the opportunity yeah. to...
visit and spend the two days on, on Great Barrier was one of the most extraordinary things I've done. The hospitality, the level of knowledge that we all develop, the hosting by the local board was amazing and I think it is part of our city, it is part of our job and it is part of what we do and I think Councillor Casey it's really important that we, you know, we visit that. I know we, we tear around the rest of the region and for some reason we get very nervous about going to, to Barrier. I think it would be a fantastic thing to do. Let's make it happen. Any other comments, questions? Can I thank you all most warmly for this awesome work and for your stewardship of this utterly beautiful place. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your time, Madam Chair and thank councillors, you. and a special thank you to Christine Fletcher and Mike. Thank Jeez. you. Lovely, thank you. Um, now, well, actually, that's a good point. So, Chris and Mike, would you like to move and second the appreciation and thanks to the presenters? Thank you. Moved by Councillor Lee, seconded by Councillor Fletcher. I'll put that. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against? Aye. Carried. It's lovely. Thank you. Um, it does. So, we are now, and just reminding people that we do have local board input, but we're going to be doing that in conjunction with the um, confidential item, and that's been agreed with our, our local board.